So we're looking at a really odd story today, and uh, one, of the odd, <clears throat> one of the oddest stories in the Bible. Um, but before we jump into the oddity of it all, let me just let me say one, at least one cool thing about the story, uh, and that is that Abraham and Sarah, after us reading and studying Genesis uh, for 19 weeks, Abraham and Sarah are going to finally have this baby that God's been promising for all these weeks. So that is worth celebrating. Um, let's jump right into the story, and let me lay the groundwork by saying. Uh, by, by making, a, a, I think, a true statement, something that applies to every one of us, and that is that no one likes an unfair test. Um, my children remind me of that all the time. They'll come home and they feel like a test that they had to take at school was unfair, and no one likes an unfair test. That's true of you. If you're attempting to... Um, get your driver's license, or get some sort of credit. If you're applying for something and you're tested, no one likes an unfair test. That's true of every one of us in this room. So there was a sophomore in one of our local uh, colleges here in the Rio Grande Valley. We have several colleges and a university or two. There, there, was, there was a sophomore in one of our local colleges and he was stressed all semester long in anticipation of this, this, uh, this final exam that was famous, notorious for being difficult, this final exam that he was taking at the end of the semester in his ornithology class. You know orn ornithology? The study of birds? <clears throat> So, um, having made what he, what he, was, what he prided himself on, ha having made uh, a valiant effort at studying, you know, several all-nighters, uh, getting ready for this uh, December final exam, he had made the ultimate effort <clears throat> in preparing for his ornithology final exam. So he was dismayed. He was a bit troubled when he walked into the classroom to take the test, but there were no testing materials. There were no, um, there, there, was, there, was, there was no multiple choice test. Uh, there were no essay-based uh, essay questions. There, there, was, there were no uh, normal, traditional testing materials um, on these birds that he'd studied so hard. Uh, there were just 25 pictures on the screen of not what you would expect, uh, not, not, not pictures of uh, 25 birds in their full plumage um, or their resplendent color. No, just pictures of birds' feet. That's all that was on the screen when he walked into the classroom. Um, the test was to identify all 25 species of birds by their feet. And this young man was incensed, as you might imagine. And he, he said out loud to the professor who now he had, he had studied under for, 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 for the entire semester, he said to the professor, this is insane. This is insane. The professor responded, it must be done. This is the final exam. Well, the frustrated young man said, I won't do it. I I'm walking out of this class. And the ag rather aggressive professor said, if you walk out, young man, you fail the final exam. Go ahead and fail me, said the young man, heading out the door. The professor cried out, Okay, you have failed the final exam. Tell me your name, young man. And the boy, he pulled up his pant legs and he said, You tell me, professor. You tell me. <laughs> the, the point is... Uh, I... I'm terrible at jokes. I have to give a, 
a pastor by the name of J.D. Greer. He, 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 I stole that from him. The point is, though, that we all hate unfair tests. And today it might seem like, in, today, in, in the story, that God unfairly tests Abraham. You be the judge. He asks if Abraham is willing to give up his most prized possession. And you might be able to relate to that. You may, you may have in your past some story in which you feel like God asked you to give up a most prized possession. And you cried unfair. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like God tested you too severely? I've had that thought about myself, my own circumstances. I've had that thought about you in your circumstances. Oh God, this seems too much for you to ask. Too much that you're asking of me, God. I was in the hospital. I, I was visiting the hospital this week. Um, and I was introduced um, to, to a, a gentleman who I determined was approximately my, approximately my age. Um, his name was, was Weechi. And, um, and his son, Weechi Jr., this isn't really their names, but I'm just, just to cover their, just to keep them anonymous. Um, Weechi Jr. was in a, uh, had been in a very bad ATV crash in September. Think about that. That's quite a few months ago. So Weechi Jr. had been in an ATV crash in September, and he had been in a coma ever since. And he'd been in McAllen, and he was now in, in Brownsville. Uh, and I, I went into the room, and I was talking to the father. Uh, and Weechi Jr. had... Uh, he had a, a, a tracheotomy tube for breathing. And he had a large contusion on his head and a surgical incision that, that could be seen from across the room. And, and Junior was, was, uh, was 22 years old. And so I estimated that from that, that, that the, uh, the, the dad was about my age. Uh, when I told him, when I told Weechi Sr. That, that I have a son who is 23 years old, uh, Weechi immediately gave me a hug. And, and it was clear that I had, at that point, I had gained credibility as one who could understand his pain. And he told me that he, told me that he was doing good, and he told me that he was a believer in Jesus Christ. And he told me the ways that God had blessed him through community over the last few months. And that he wasn't sad. That's what he told me. But, but when I began to, I, 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 held, <clears throat> I had my arm around Weechi Sr. and I held Weechi Jr.'s hand. And as I prayed for them, the father began to weep, as you can imagine. And I'm... I went, I went back to see him the next day, and, and, and there was some improvement. He was sitting up. But, but I, I would tell you that when I prayed for, for Junior that day, I am, I am pretty sure that he smiled at me. Um, so I think that it's good for us to ask, why? I mean, that's real. That's honest. That's gritty. That's, that's being real before the Lord. To say, if God is good, and God does good, because we throw that around all the time, do you know that, where that comes from? That's from Psalm 119. God is good and God does good. If that is true, then when He asks too much of you, or when God leads you into a valley, His nature hasn't changed. He still is good if he ever was good, and he still does good if he ever did good. So if those things are true about God's nature, then we have to ask, what's going on here, God? Why? What are you up to? Abraham, who we're looking at again today, and his wife, Sarah, Abraham is a great example of a worshiper. 
Someone who worships God, who follows God with his whole heart. Someone who is uh, fully surrendered. We would say that he is all in. And maybe that's you. Maybe you feel like you're all in, and so you would question, like, why me, God? I'm all in. I'm, I'm fully committed. <clears throat> God is about to ask Abraham for something, actually for someone, as a sacrifice. The word sacrifice is a word that we use to some degree in it is kind of a street term, kind of a, a word that we use in today's modern language. I'll give you some examples here in a minute. But the word originally, um, the word sacrifice of thousands of years ago, uh, it meant that worshipers, they would, take, they would take a lamb or they would take a cow, they would, they would kill it, they would quarter it, and they would burn it on this massive stone fireplace called an altar. Maybe you've seen something like that in a movie. The, with the destruction of the, of the temple, that, that no longer was or is a, a, a practice in Judaism, but it was for a long time, the sacrificing of an animal. So that's the, orig, origi, um, the origin of the word. Today when we offer a sacrifice, you know, maybe you use that phrase, like you might say, man, I, I sacrificed a lot. T- today when we use the word sacrifice, um, or when we offer a sacrifice, that sort of use of the language, sometimes it's what the Bible calls a living sacrifice. In other words, you didn't literally kill anything. Maybe you give uh, some of your money, or maybe you give some of your time, your dollars and your days. Maybe you give it to somebody who's in need. You give them help and you give them money. Maybe you give it to the church. You serve in the church and you give money to the church. You sacrifice your dollars and your days. You're giving over something to God. And we, would, we could call that a living sacrifice. Romans 12.1 says this. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. What Paul is calling us to do here is to live lives that are holy, to live lives that follow God's design, that follow God's instruction. And as we live our lives that way, we're, we're sacrificing, we're, uh, we're disciplining our, our bodies, our actions, our behaviors, our choices. And as we do that, as we come under the lordship uh, of Christ, we sacrifice but it's a living sacrifice. So in Abraham's life, his son Isaac, who is now born, um, his son Isaac, his only son, Isaac, was clearly his most prized possession. If you have a son, if you have a daughter, you probably feel to some degree that same way. You can relate. But it's rather unique in this case because Abraham and Sarah had waited for Isaac's birth for 25 years. It's hard to believe this to be true, but Abraham was 100 years old. Sarah was 90 years old. I suppose God waited that long so he could say, look, this really is a miracle. Isaac, born to a 100-year-old man, a 90-year-old lady, God gets the credit when that happens, right? So, so this miraculous birth, the boy is finally here. So now, on this fateful day that we're about to read about, everything just goes wrong. In fact, the story I'm about to tell you is, in my opinion, one of the most unsettling, disturbing stories in all the Bible. I'm going to tell you some of the story, and we're going to read some of the story. So Abraham says, says, what God? <laughs> I don't understand. I don't think I heard you right. God says, take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, whom you love so much. And go into the land of Moriah 
sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will point out to you. Abraham. You mean a, a sacrifice? You mean a living sacrifice, right, God? You mean a living sacrifice? No, no, a burnt offering. Now think on this. Abraham had likely slaughtered many lambs in his day, like he would now prepare to slaughter his own son Isaac. The next morning, Abraham, he saddled his donkey, and he chopped firewood, and he took his teenage son. As a father of teenagers, I can't even imagine. He took his teenage son Isaac up into the mountains, and it must have been a very quiet walk, a very quiet journey. Actually, it was three days of walking. Think on that. I couldn't have made it one day, but think of that third day, and you're still making the journey. And, and they're walking, and Abraham's thinking, and no doubt and Abraham's questioning. And after three days, Abraham and Isaac come to the spot, and Abraham knows in his heart, this is it. And Isaac turns his head and says, Father, we have the wood and we have the fire, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice, the burnt offering? And Abraham says, God will provide a lamb, my son. God will provide a lamb. And I think he meant that. And they both went on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told Abraham to go, he built an altar and he placed the wood on it. Then he tied Isaac up and laid him on the altar over the wood. Let me stop there for a second. Abraham is estimated to be about 15 years old. He could have he made an escape if he wanted to. But there's a deep trust in his father. My father has taught me about God all these years. Something bigger is going on here. He tied Isaac up and laid him on the altar over the wood. And Abraham took the knife and he lifted it up to kill his son as a sacrifice to the Lord. At that moment, the angel of the Lord shouted to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, he answered, I'm listening. Lay down the knife, the angel said. Do not hurt the boy in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld even your beloved son from me. The story ends with Abraham noticing that there is an animal um, stuck in the bushes um, caught in uh, the thorns, and just as he told his son, God will provide a lamb, they sacrificed the lamb that day and not Isaac. Now in reading this story, maybe you do what I do. I, it's easy for me to ask the question, God, how could you? I mean, I think that's pretty normal if we're honest like, that is so cruel, God. How could you do that? That doesn't make sense. I mean, I even as a pastor sometimes think, God, why did, you, why did you put that in the Bible? It makes us look bad. Right? I mean, if we're honest, like, that's, like, I hope, I hope non-Christians don't read that because then, like, they'll debate it on a news network and it'll be, it's, it's like a black eye for, for the Bible, you know? I think to jump to that conclusion or to, to, to go there too quickly, God, how could you? How cruel? I, I think to do so is to think too little of God. What I mean by that is don't assume that God did not know the ultimate outcome. I can show you that from Scripture in a moment. But, but don't assume that, that he did not know if Abraham would pass the test. Don't assume that Abraham, that, or that, that God 
like waited to the last minute to decide, should I let Abraham go through with this? Should I not let him go through with this? That is not what is going on here. God is not, nor has he ever been limited in his knowledge of anything. He is not bound by the time-space continuum. He is not limited in his understanding. He knows everything. He knows what you're about to do. He knows what you will do tomorrow. He knows what you've done in the past. There are no secrets when it comes to God. God is not, this test was not meant to show God anything. He already knew. This testing was, in, was intended to show Abraham who he was as a person. God never intended to go ahead with this murder. He knew Abraham would pass the test. Let me say that again. God never intended for Abraham <clears throat> to commit child sacrifice. God has always, throughout the, the Old Testament, abhorred the pagan ritual of child sacrifice. God has never, God has never led a man or a woman to sacrifice his own child as some sort of weird burnt offering to the Lord. If you've, been, if you've been here for the last few weeks as we've been studying Abraham's life, what you, what you know is that Abraham, he, he holds this high esteemed position in God's plan. For the last month, we've been reading these passages, these, <clears throat> these promises where God says, Abraham, I've got, I've got an extra special big plan for you, meaning you're going to have one son, and from that one son will bo- be born A nation, and your nation, ultimately the nation of Israel, will bless, won't just turn inside itself and bless itself. No, it will bless the entire world. And ultimately what he's talking about is Jesus, that Jesus would be born through the nation of Israel, and Jesus would be the Savior of the world. My point is, God has always had this amazing big plan for Abraham. And, and, and so he put Abraham in an unusually difficult position. And then he made a way for him to be rescued. Hebrews 11 says this about Abraham. If you've ever wondered, like, why did God do that? And, and, and what, was it, what was Abraham thinking? Like, I wouldn't do that even if God asked me to. I mean, let's just be honest, right? Maybe that's what you would say. But, but look what... Look what we, what we learned from the New Testament. It says this. <clears throat> it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Get, get this. Abraham assumed that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. That's Hebrews eleven seventeen. Write that down and maybe study that a little bit more closely today. If this, if this story is super confusing to you, go read Hebrews 11 and, and, and try and resolve this tension in your own heart. What is this passage right here saying? It's saying Abraham had the faith to believe. I waited for decades for Isaac. I waited for decades for this son and God promised that this son would be born, uh, and, and he was. <clears throat> and if God takes Isaac from me, he will surely bring him back to life. He will surely bless me with, with his rebirth. He will surely give me uh, another son, some blessing. God will make this good. He, God will make this right. I trust the Lord in this. I wonder, out loud, when God takes a person through an unusually difficult test, might it be evidence that God will use that person in an extremely good way in the future? Maybe that's you, friend. Maybe that's you. Is God taking you through an extremely, 
an unusually difficult situation because he has an extremely, unusually unique blessing for you in the future. Here's a thought. This story, if we take it to the next level, Abraham and Isaac is actually a story foreshadowing something to come in the future. Now, I don't know if you remember from your English or from your literature classes, but foreshadowing, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty uh, common term that like you read something, English majors, don't, don't crucify me here, but you read something early on in a piece of literature, it, it, it doesn't necessarily make sense, but it's foreshadowing. It's, it's talking about something that's going to happen later on. Maybe it's sort of symbolic of, of something that, that uh, it's going to happen later. Shout out to Miss Ed, Ed Edwards, my, my junior uh, lit teacher. But, but so foreshadowing is saying that something, it, it, it's, it's, it's telling you about something that's really going to actually happen later. You just get a little bit of a taste of that, a symbol of what's to come. You think maybe Abraham being called to go right to the edge and almost sacrifice his son. Could, could this be foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the New Testament? And that is God the Father will actually go through with it. He will actually sacrifice his only begotten son for the sins of the world. Like, like Abraham, except extremely more, like Abraham, Jesus, he holds an, ex, an esteemed position in God's plan. And, and, and God put Jesus in an unusually difficult situation. And in our own lives, in my life, in your life, it is easy to ask how could you be so cruel to make me go through this, through this, God? Don't be so quick to jump to the conclusion that, that God doesn't know what he's doing. Do you have the faith to believe that, God, that, that, that if God takes this from you, whatever it is, that he has the power to give it back, that he has the power to make it good again, that he has the power beyond our own ability to comprehend the power to make it right. Yeah, there's a bigger picture here. Abraham and Isaac are symbolic of what God will do in the New Testament in our lives. Abraham tells, or Abraham's life tells of the, of the future coming of Jesus. John 3 says this, For this is how God loved the world, <clears throat> he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And Romans 5, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. This is the second week in a row in which we see this picture of symbolism, of, of foreshadowing of Abraham's life, telling the, the story, the future story of Jesus. Remember last week, there was this great symbolism where, God, where, where Abraham prayed, prayed to God, and, and they determined together that, that, God, that, that God would actually look on the righteousness of a few and count it as righteousness for the many. When, they were try, when, when Abraham was trying to save the city of Sodom. And that is a picture, a symbol, foreshadowing of, of what Jesus did. That his righteousness alone covers the sins of the many. And, and now this week, the second picture of symbolism regarding Jesus. So Jesus is a true and a, a better picture of Isaac, who was not just offered up by his father, but was truly sacrificed, actually came under 
the death blow for, for us. And when God said to Abraham, Now I know you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from me. In the same way as, as the angel of the Lord said that to Abraham, now we see your faithfulness, we, we see your devotion. In the same way, can we not today, this morning, utter practically, uh, practically the same words and, and say something like this, Now we know, God, now we know that you love us because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from us. So we throw the word gospel around here at at River Church all the time. Hopefully we don't throw it around, but we use it. We use the word gospel, and I tell you this all the time. One of my greatest fears is that you go home and and you haven't a clue what we mean when we say the gospel. Do you understand the gospel? The gospel story is the story of Jesus. And the story of Jesus is this, that, that God the Son, who was co-equal with God, he is God, he determined that equality, this, this honor and this, and this, this um, esteem in heaven, that, 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 this, that this esteem in heaven was not something that he should grasp or hold on to, but he gave that up and he came to the earth. He didn't give up any of his godness. He just gave up the esteem of being God. And he came to earth and he took on the form of a man and he lived a sinless life which made him the perfect sacrifice. If he would have screwed up, he wouldn't have been a perfect sacrifice. But he lived a sinless life, and then he died the death of a criminal, although he was an innocent man. Your sins, my sins, God predetermined to put those sins on Jesus. And then Jesus died, paying the penalty that we deserve, or that we should have paid. And then he was resurrected, and he was ascended into heaven, and now he reigns and rules over us all. My fear is that you misunderstand the gospel and that, you under, that you, your misunderstanding would say that the gospel is primarily about how you must obey, how you must follow the rules, how you must be good. I've told you this before. The most common answer when you ask someone, why will you go to heaven when you die? Your relationship with God the Father, what is it based on? Sadly, the most common answer is, I try to be good. I, I've never killed anyone. I, I try to do more good than I do bad. My fishing buddies, when I have a captive audience on the boat, we'll have this discussion, and that is the most common answer that I hear. And that's moralism, that's morality, but that's not the gospel. The way that you are saved, if you are saved by your ability to do good, you will never reach God's standard of perfection. But Jesus has reached God's standard of perfection. And so he paid the price. He now places his righteousness on you. See, we misunderstand. We think that the gospel is primarily about how you must obey. But the gospel is actually primarily about how God provides. Remember, God provided a lamb for Abraham, for, for Abraham and Isaac just in the nick of time. And God has provided Jesus as a sacrifice for your sins just in the nick of time. He has made a way for your salvation as he made a way for Isaac's salvation. closing, I want to ask you to, to take a moment, and I'm going to give you four questions. We're not going to write them down. I'm just going to speak them. And I want you to do a little bit of self-evaluation, okay? You say, that's weird, Randy. I don't want to do... Just, just trust me. I wouldn't ask you to do anything terribly weird. I might ask you to do something a little weird, but only if it's good for you. So if you would, just in your own mind, you don't have to talk to 
to anyone, or please don't talk to anyone, in your own mind, if you would just self-evaluate a bit, let me ask you some questions that may seem a bit random, but they're intended to take you somewhere. So think on these questions. Number one, what are you living for? What are you living for? Like your purpose, your, your direction. You, you may not be able to answer that question totally, but ponder it. Think on it more later. You'd say, this is, this is what I'm living for, Randy. A few of you can answer that question. The rest of us should, should struggle with that. What are you, what are you living for? Question number two. Who or what is your greatest treasure? Again, don't answer out loud. What is your greatest treasure? That, that person or that thing which, you, um, which your affection burns hottest for. What is your greatest treasure? Now, if I, if I can respectfully um, push, push us all, all just a bit. If you, if you, especially as a man, if you say, my, you know, my greatest treasure, what am I, what am I living for? I'm living for my, my, my children and my wife, which is, which is a very respectable answer. But I would, I would, I would challenge that a bit. And here's how I would challenge that. Um, I would say, well, for a number of us in this room, and this is if you're a if you're a lady and you're a, a wife, then you could say my husband and my, my kids. But 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 if if you would say my my wa- I live for my wife and my kids, then here's what I would here's how I would challenge you. If you your wife and your kids are doing fine, so why are you still a reconciled? If that's really what you're living for. That's an honorable answer, but is that really is that really what you're chasing? Is that really your deepest motivation? Because they're fine and you're still all torn up, still very dissatisfied. It's not true of all of you, but that's true of some of you. Third question. What might God be asking of you today? For some of you, you're going right, you're, you're right in the middle of something. You're like, this is what God is asking of me, and, and it's troubling, and it's difficult, and I'm wondering if it's too much, and I'm, I'm working through it, and I would, I would commend you. You work through it. There are often not easy answers in all this, so, so I would commend you in that. Some of us, we're not quite, just think on that. What might God be asking of you today? And if you're like, I haven't a clue, Randy, I'm not following what you're talking about, that, that, that's fine. But some of us, I think, here today are really struggling. God's asking you for something. He's asking you to do something. He's leading you down some path, and you're just, you're dragging your feet, and you're just not sure. Is it, the last question, is it too much for him to ask? I. I almost want to apologize in that I'm not giving you answers here at the end of the sermon. I'm actually asking questions. But I think these are, these are significant questions that you should wrestle with today, that you should go home and wrestle with. Might it be that God is asking you for something really big, uh, really, really difficult, because on the other end, on the other side, he's got something really tremendous. And, and it might not be tangible. It might be his love. It, it, it's most definitely it's it, it, it's it's most definitely a home in heaven for eternity. But but what else what else might it be? Is God asking you for something really difficult right now? Because on the other end, He's got something extremely tremendous. That's what he did in Abraham's life. 
He asked him for something really difficult, something I'm not sure that I would, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have done. I'm no Abraham. I'm no Jesus. Abraham did what the father asked, and on the other side of that, a nation, a nation from his one child. He asked him for something extremely difficult, and he, he did something on the other side extremely tremendous. True of Jesus as well. The Bible says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Jesus didn't enjoy the cross. Jesus didn't love the cross. Jesus, Jesus humbly asked the Father, if there's another way, let's take the other way, Dad. But the Bible says that the joy on the other end For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. What I encourage you to what I encourage you to consider today, friends, is that that for the sake of the joy on the other end, endure. Whatever you're going through today, for the sake of the joy on the other side of this trial, endure. God is good, and God does good. Let's pray.